Okay, in this video, I'm going to review a case I found on the internet here. I'm going to switch screens here so I can, I can walk you through this. This is a lawsuit with a bank. You know, it's uh, the bank is um, Citizens Bank, okay? And they're suing this gentleman for uh, whatever. I think it's, um, doesn't matter, right? It's $26,000, something like that. $27,000, okay? So notice how Citizens Bank, it comes in here with uh, the complaint. Here's the case number. It was filed recently, uh, October 15th, 2021. It's in Pennsylvania and see how it alleges everything in here. And then it's got the first count for breach of contract. Okay. So in a, in a debt collection lawsuit like this, sometimes there's a statement, there's a, there's a cause of action or a complaint for a breach of contract, which there really should be. Now, some attorneys over the years have gotten around this. They've changed the pleading requirements so they can, instead of saying breach of contract, which requires the production of the contract, okay, evidence of the contract, they'll say, a stated account or open account, which does not require production of the contract or proof of the terms of the contract. So they here put breach of contract. Okay, well, that means I'm looking for a contract. Now, in count two, they used unjust enrichment, meaning it's not fair that this person gets to keep this money, not pay it back when we took the risk, which is a joke because the banks never take a risk, anyways. So when I look through this, okay, so my first question is, without even really reading too much detail is, I look to see where it's alleged that there's an agreement, okay? So in fact, they did. In line five, it, plaintiff alleges there's a card member agreement, and that's exhibit A. Well, I'm going to skip right over there and check it out. Now, that was only two counts, right? They, it's only a two-count complaint. So anyways, I go down, and I'm seeing here like, um, what is this? It's some sort of documentation that the plaintiff may have in its own records, I guess. Maybe it's a court record. I don't know. I don't really care. This is a, um, uh, appears to be a statement of the account. And it's, it's not really something that we can use. It's, it's going to, it's not something that the plaintiff can rely upon to establish a debt, but they'll, they'll try to do that to show like circumstances giving rise to the debt. Then uh, you've got some redacted things here, and then we get into, here's the promissory note. Now, this is the card member agreement. It's the promissory note. So if we go through here, you got the loan terms, all right? You've got the terms and definitions, promise to pay. Those are components of a note, right? So what I'm looking for is a connection <clears throat> that Exhibit A may have to the plaintiff. I mean, I'm sorry, to the, uh, well, to the plaintiff, yeah. So Citizens Bank is the lender here, apparently. It says it right here. There's no assignee or anything like that. But I'm also looking to see where the defendant is tied into this, these terms. So maybe I need to see a signature or some date on there to make a connection, right? So anyways, I'm just scrolling through. Look at the different terms. See here. When does interest accrue? These are important things in a loan agreement. What about repayment? What constitutes default, right? May I repay the loan early? Optional services. What's a default? That's important. You have to have that. So it's getting, I'm seeing it's more going to be more difficult to make a response here. I mean, I might have to answer the complaint. I might have to, if I'm doing this, I might have to, um, I'm trying to look for a way where I can, I can admit everything in the complaint and I can just say the court doesn't have jurisdiction. And I could do that if this exhibit a contract doesn't show a nexus between the plaintiff and the defendant. So far it's looking pretty good. I mean, the plaintiff has all the terms needed. It's identified itself in this document. And then we get into the bottom here. So what my first uh, glance at this was to just scroll through and I see there are other terms of this note. Okay. And we got this arbitration agreement. We'll get to that in just a second, right? So we, we scroll through here. All right. And they try to cover this so they can use it in all the states. So they have certain restrictions in some states they have to address. Um, scroll through here. And now I'm going to see, here's the signature page. Now, signature page is, it's not really part of this agreement. But let's just say it is. I mean, I'm not going to make that argument. I don't have to. You'll see. So let's just say here's a signature page, and they're going to say we have it on file. All right. 
I can challenge that. But I can also challenge the fact that this is not part of the agreement. It doesn't appear to be. So at the very least, I can come back here and say, all right, I'm going to ask the court for dismissal. But if I do that, I'm going to have to admit everything that, that was alleged in the complaint. And then I'm going to argue that this agreement that they're saying is Exhibit A, taken at face value, let's just say it's, I, you have to admit that that's the agreement. But I'm also going to say that it's not authenticated or it's not self-authenticating. In other words, this agreement needs a witness to make it valid, to make it evidentiary, to be used against the defendant. I could say that. I don't think that'd be a strong argument though. So that's the end of that, right? I guess that was exhibit A. I don't see, there's ex maybe that's exhibit B, I don't know, but let's just say exhibit A, okay? So that is the card member agreement. So let's just look back up here. Here's what, a point, here's what I wanted to make a point of. So let me go back up to the pleading. And this is called the pleading. We look at this first. They're talking, they're saying why the court has jurisdiction up here. Okay. You have to be resident in an area. And story of the case. And basically it's saying we sent him, we sent him statements. They didn't pay. He didn't pay. Therefore, there's a default. Here's the amount owed. And then also it's not fair because he gets all that money, doesn't have to pay it back. You know, what's funny is it's never going to be unjust. First of all, the bank didn't lend anything. Second of all, if the defendant never pays the bank back, then the defendant or the plaintiff is going to write it off as a loss and recover that money for the from the tax system. So it's going to spread that loss. Okay, if, we, if it is a loss, it's not a loss, but let's just say it's a loss and that is going to be spread amongst the community of people that file 1040s. That's who absorbs all this stuff. So there can't possibly un be unjust enrichment in reality, but they're gonna act as if they're just lost and they can't recover it. All right, so that's my commentary on that. You can read it, you can read this for yourself. It's common stuff. All right, what I really wanted to point out is that um, if we ask for dismissal, and I think in Pennsylvania, it has to be a demure. So I really don't care. But the point is, we, if we ask for dismissal, we have to admit everything that's pleaded properly in this complaint. And I don't see a problem with this complaint. I have to say, I think they got everything covered. So let's take it at face value and let's ask for a dismissal. But let's tell the court this. Let's just make a special limited appearance. That means you're not accepting, you know, it's not a general appearance and you're not saying, I accept the court's jurisdiction. You're just saying, I'm making an appearance for the purpose of responding to the complaint, okay? Until my motion is denied, the court tentatively has jurisdiction, just enough to hear my response, right? And then we come down here. This is my, I called it a demure verification, a verified motion to dismiss. I'm, you know, we can, we can use both here, right? So this is my effort to respond to this, this document, just to give you guys an example of how you could do this. All right, so now I just you know identify who I am. I'm I'm appearing by special limited appearance, and in response to the complaint, and I'm basically saying the complaint doesn't state a cause of action. Here's why: assuming all allegations to be true, and therefore that Exhibit A is the card member agreement as alleged. Let's take it at face value. According to Section 15 or Paragraph 15, of uh, both the plaintiff and the defendant are subject to compulsory binding arbitration as a means of resolving any disputes or material breaches of the alleged agreement. What? Let's go back down to 15 here. Let's go look at exhibit A. Okay. We're going to go over to exhibit A. Uh-huh. Scrolling down, scrolling down. All right, here we go. So there's the note we're talking about. Let's go to section 15. So 15 has to do with an arbitration agreement. Okay, we have to, we're accepting that this is what it, they say it is. So it says basically that if you don't opt out of this, you, you have no choice but to go to arbitration. You waive your right to have a court or a jury decide the case. Okay. 
if you do not opt out, you do not have you will ne not have the right to go to court. You have the right to to cancel or opt out, right? So they give you that, and here's the dirt. Here's the deal: if you have a dispute and you're not able to resolve it, you agree that you have to go through arbitration, and you have to go through. They say here you're waiving your right to trial as well, but you have to go through the American Arbitration Association or JAMS. I forget what JAMS stands for, but it's an arbitration service, and these are governed by the Federal Arbitration Act. Okay, Title Nine of the U.S. Code, Federal Arbitration Act. This is compulsory binding arbitration. That means that you cannot ignore it. You cannot go to court while this is in the contract, and if you use this contract as evidence of the obligation and you file a case in court, the court is divested of having any jurisdiction because the contract itself precludes the court from having jurisdiction. If the court has to rule over it, the court has to say, well, we don't have jurisdiction. You guys have to go to arbitration. Okay, you can see this for yourself, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. Right to cancel, opt out. If you don't opt out, you're stuck with it. So we asked the court for dismissal, and we're saying this, that the plaintiff failed to commence any arbitration process as required by Section 15 of the card member agreement. The complaint is not a petition for confirmation of any arbitration award. So once the arbitration is completed, the prevailing party can go to the court and ask for an arbitration award. Usually the creditor does that, right? So they get the court's approval of it, they, but the court doesn't get to decide on the case. They only get to approve it so that way the plaintiff has access to the police, okay, the executive function to collect on the money, to levy on assets, okay? That's the only reason it goes to court for confirmation, not to decide the case. So the complaint is not a confirmation of an arbitration award. And no award has been sought according to the card member agreement. Nor has it been sought according to the pleading. It hasn't been alleged. It wasn't in the pleading that uh, they were seeking uh, a confirmation of the award. You guys, you can go look back and look at it for yourself. So the court has no jurisdiction over an agreement, over this agreement or any agreement that is subject to binding arbitration. The plaintiff has failed to allege that the defendant has opted out. The plaintiff has failed to allege a cause of action that is exempt from the binding arbitration provision. And I would say that just because I don't want to give the plaintiff any more information than I absolutely need to prevail here to get dismissed. But the, the reality is, is that you can get around an arbitration clause if there's an issue of fraud. You can sue for fraud irrespective of whether or not you have an arbitration clause in a contract that gave rise to the fraud. There is no fraud here, of course. There would never be a cause of action, but I just didn't want to say it. So anyways, that would be the exception. And so therefore, the plaintiff has waived its right to proceed in this court or in arbitration and cannot proceed either in this court or any other court or within any arbitration form, but the fact that it has commenced the above captioned matter in violation of its own binding arbitration agreement and therefore has waived any rights it had to arbitrate with the defendant. So the fact that there was a binding arbitration clause in the contract on which the plaintiff was relying to get a remedy, to sue for money, and the plaintiff failed to follow that process of commencing an arbitration proceeding before the American Arbitration Association or JAMS, then constitutes a waiver of its right to seek a remedy at all. It waived its right to go to court because it didn't have one in the beginning, and it waived its right to arbitration. It can't go back now. And I just cited, you know, there's just a rule here about motions to dismiss. Now, there is case law on this, and I, I had some from Florida. I can't find it, but um, uh, anyways, you guys can do your own research. You can shepherdize things. But basically, when there's a binding arbitration clause, if it's not complied with, then the parties waive their rights to a remedy. They've restricted their rights to a particular type of remedy or process. And when they go around that, they actually waive their rights to that. So this is a formality I just put in here. But basically, this is what this is what we can expect. So what's going to happen is the court is ultimately going to, uh, going to uh, dismiss the case with prejudice. He can never bring it back. Citizens is out that money, and the attorney made a huge mistake. Made a huge mistake. He, he probably didn't even read it. 
Um, maybe he didn't know the case law. I don't know. Now let's say the judge, let's say the judge um, lets the case proceed. You can ask for summary judgment. You can go into discovery. I mean, there's really nothing to do else to do. Really, you can you can go into discovery and establish the contract if you want. But it doesn't really matter because if the court never had jurisdiction from the beginning, it can never acquire jurisdiction. Nothing. It can't be cured in this case. So you can let them do whatever you want. You they can, they can default on it or whatever, and you can move and have it set aside. If the other side prevails in this situation under this set of facts, you can appeal it. And yeah, it's it's a, a bother to have to appeal it. But if you appeal it, it'll get reversed on appeal and you'll win. There is no way. It's jurisdictional. Okay. Just want to share that with y'all. Sometimes you just got to be careful about looking through some of these pleadings. Sometimes the attorneys make big fat mistakes and you can capitalize on them once you, once you know a couple of things. Hope this helps and hope you're not in that situation. But if you are, hope this helps.